This is Creed Williams back with another podcast. So in the previous uh, podcast, we had a discussion about newbie meets expert. Joining me was Dylan and Benji. So with today's podcast, we'll also be having Benji back on the podcast again. With today's topic, speaking about North American Calibrates. Benji, how are you today? Doing good, thanks. And you, man? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm doing quite well. I'm doing quite well. You know, um, after last night's episode, well, spending till how late in the morning trying to edit that thing while also having schoolwork to do. <laughs> yeah, I feel quite well. <laughs> Not gonna lie. So yeah, are you ready to start with the topics today? Okay. So, okay. So of course we have to introduce ourselves again. So for the new people on the podcast, I'm Creed's Venoms. I'm a venomous reptile keeper here in Cottonville of Gauteng in South Africa. And I basically have quite a long time experience with a variety of different snakes from Calubrid to yellow anacondas to other type of boas and pythons to venomous and also crocodilian species as well. So Benjamin, can you give us a bit of an introduction towards yourself? Yeah, sure. Um... Hi everyone, uh, I'm I'm Benji, I am uh, 18 years of age and I am a reptile keeper and enthusiast, have been for basically half my life. I am uh, based in South Africa obviously and uh, my species of interest, I uh, specialize in the keeping of colubrids and colubroids. I have a, um, a particular interest in barons racers, false water cobras, Asian rat snakes, cat slash mangrove snakes, super dwarf reticulated pythons, Australasian pythons, a few North American colubrids, and then some boas. So a, a pretty wide, um, yeah, interest right there. <laughs> All right, and yeah, then it, it's just me, just here randomly, me just keeping venomous, etc. Yeah, I'm not that fun. I like you with your a lot of variety of different stuff here and in the clip in the old collection but yeah so everyone um, please welcome benji benji clearwitz to the podcast so let us uh, again uh, well begin so with our first topic is the natural history and taxonomy so how would you like sorry yeah sure um uh Cool, we could jump in. I just, uh, I feel like it'd be a good time just to quickly throw out a disclaimer before um, I start getting too technical, is that uh, I am by no means an expert and I have, I do this purely for the love and the passion of the hobby. Sometimes the information I may get is from sources which are not really as trustworthy and at the end of the day, I make mistakes, we all do, and I am uh quick to learn and correct my mistakes so yeah but uh let's uh without further ado let's get uh cracking on our topic of the discussion which is going to be the pantherophus um also i just want to quickly say here that uh, there is some controversy concerning the taxonomy and scientific naming of these species uh, some of them, you know, have been lumped together to make up, you know, a new species on its own, even though they tend to look remotely different. So we're not going to be doing that today and jumping down a rabbit hole. And I think we'll just stick to the more old school names as we go. So let's uh, let, let's jump into it. I think let's uh, start with corn snakes, which, uh, uh, as, as we all know, is a is a pretty awesome snake what do you what do you what do you take uh on the corn snakes so basically uh, as far as for people that don't know corn snakes are basically a global world's most common pet snake well everyone could ever wish for like every single black who's been keeping black and chilo who's been keeping uh, a variety of, a variety of different reptiles well they've the first thing they should probably 95% of people that started with reptiles started with a corn snake and what the thing of what I love about them is not not only because they're probably one of the most docile animals one of the most easiest to keep but also for their variety of different colors so as far as I know a couple of stuff I used to own back in the day ghosts ghost motleys a malinistics butters 
I had an 8 mallet and 6 stripe. What else was there? Hmm. And also of the, not really something I owned, but another type of interesting morph that fascinates me the most is the scaleless. Something I would like to have some. Ooh, yeah, totally, man. I I agree, and uh, that that is definitely a peculiar morph which we do not see too often in any snake species. So that is definitely a cool one. Indeed, and they're so they're basically. I wouldn't say not at all. Like they they're pretty new to the South African keeping because I know Ultimate Exotics has now new scaleless available. But four, five thousand bucks. Whew. That's a lot just for a normal scale. This. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. But uh, if you're thinking something so out of this world and just totally crazy, um, I think uh, it's definitely worth that kind of money spending on it. Yeah, it is so, uh, because I know. Well, of course, the fact that corn are so popular now, the prices are basically falling down down underneath the earth by now because as, as far as what i've seen like i know there's some people who sell them as pets some people sell them as feeders normally the blacks who feed well who sells them as pets usually sell normal ha well yeah normal hatch things for around 100 150 bucks and I, i've actually seen on the venomous groups people selling normal corn snakes as feeders for 50 bucks and then a man mystics when I started, I think I think I paid six seven hundred rand for hatching a man mystics. Now we pay barely two hundred bucks for a man mystic, which is albino corn snakes. But hey, what's your opinion about that? Well, I think it is not just locally in South Africa. I hear about breeders in the United States complaining about uh, the corn snakes, which are dropping in value so quickly as well. Just because a species is so readily available and so common, it uh, it does detrimental to their their value and so on. So people definitely should be more aware of that, I think. And uh, it is definitely our duty as reptile keepers to ensure that they don't uh, become undervalued like that. So uh, that's also true. But yeah, because I know. I know a lot of people, like especially with Dylan we had yesterday on the podcast, uh, a lot of people, they get it's like, everyone wants, to, everyone wants to have their first clutch of animals, which is a good thing. However, the problem is, with a lot of people, they abuse the power once they actually got their first clutch. And then they get even more corn snakes and more and more, start breeding them, adding random morphs into each other, and then the, the ugly ones or the normals or the single jeans ones, they just sell for like 200 bucks. And also for the fact that not only just one person does it, but everyone does it. But at the end of the day, there's so many that they actually don't want to spend a lot of cash anymore. For example, let's just say there's like 50 corn snake breeders in my area. So, and this one bloke sells normal corn snakes for like 500 bucks. And the other one sells for four fifty bucks. Which one would you rather go to, price wise? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and that does that, that does come down to the quality of animals that you're getting. But if it's uh, the same quality animals for less money, then I think, especially for a newbie keeper who, uh, let's face it, most of the time are young kids and uh, teenagers getting into this, and they're quite limited on. On money and so on. well so am i <laughs> but uh, yeah then that would definitely be a more appealing option yeah it is so but like let's just take an example let's just say you're the teenager who wants to start with corn snakes there's a bug selling normals for 500 and a no and another one selling for 450 which one would you go to well if they're the same quality animals then i would definitely go for the the cheaper snake exactly and then once someone finds out one of other breeder is like this one got his snake sold for four for four fifty. I should try that, and then he doesn't get those animals sold, and he's like, oh, I'll drop the price down for, to four hundred, and then the other bloke to three fifty, and then the other bloke to three hundred, then the other one for two fifty. By the end of the day, that snake that snake is worth nothing by then. And then compare that to our future colubrids, 
Well, for example, uh, other type of rat snakes. For example, what, what other common rat snakes, colubrids you see around, well, Pantheopis, do you see around here? Yeah, um, uh, I think we'll get into those uh, at a bit of a late, later stage and discuss individually what they're going for. But uh, yeah, I can tell you right now already that uh, the corn snake is definitely going to be the more commonly available of the ones we're discussing. And uh, yeah, that that is a, 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 a bit of a problem, honestly. But uh, yeah, let's let's see. I want to start as well with the natural history of these snakes. So um, where do we where do we find these snakes? We find them in North America, obviously, and way to the um, south eastern part of the United States. So from Florida, you can find these guys in the Keys all the way throughout Florida up into the state of New Jersey. So they definitely hugging this eastern um, shoreline of the United States of America. So with that being said, such a decent um, range means that that translates into a bunch of different habitats and biomes, which translates into hardiness, into captivity. So that is what realistically makes these snakes absolutely bulletproof in captivity. Yeah, it's also, it's also true though. But yeah, because I've noticed, well, they also thrive with a variety of other different type of animals. Well, not just snakes in general, but like other type of predators as well. And then also the people taking them out of, of the wild. Because if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a state somewhere in the U.S. that allows people to take, well, I think especially corn snakes out of the wild. Do you, oh, do you know, do you know where it is? I, I don't know uh, about too many of the laws in the United States, but I do know that certain states in the United States do permit um, people collecting animals from the wild legally. Indeed. So, and then you get case, uh, case it in. You don't even need a permit to go take, an, take for example, a puff out of the wild. It just, you can keep it there. However, for the other provinces, you need, you need permits for them. So, basically... Yeah. Now we're probably going to go on to the captive population in South Africa. It's 1.8 meters. Mm -mm. Okay, now that's a large size, especially for such actually a small snake. Because I remember my average corn snakes I've kept was probably around 1.2, 1.3 meters. But 180 centimeters, 1.8 meters. Mmm. Okay, now that's a size though. That is, that's probably the same size as what I around. I think a juvenile Taiwanese rat snake would go for same length. Yeah, no, that's uh, quite yeah, easy. no, that uh, the Taiwanese rat snakes do get quite large. I'd say uh, one point eight meters would probably be the adult length for a male Taiwanese rat snake. So yeah, um, there is sexual dimorphism to my understanding with the species. So that uh, one hundred and eighty-seven centimeter individual must have been a female so yeah that is pretty insane uh let's quickly talk about the color phases that these snakes in because to my understanding there is three color phases that we see available of these which is the miami phase the okatee phase and the nominate or just normal phase um what is your take on those difference wise? We can throw a bunch of uh, photos up so that everyone can see what that looks like. But uh, what what do you think about that? In my opinion, I've basically what I've seen also. I used to have an OKT, but like a OKT reverse AML type of gene. Um, out of all those, my personal favorite should be the Miami. Now with a regular corn snake, well I. If I want to see a normal corn snake, and then I'll probably be looking at these small little new, um, small hatchlings that are brown. And those Miamis, they don't have that lot of orange like you see on normal corn snakes. So, I don't know, I just, in my opinion, I love those and then the Okatees with those dark circles on their backs. Now that's something I love, personally. But, because as far as I know, it's, it's three wild type genes. I don't think it's actually any dominant genes, I think. Like if you take a Miami. 
So these phases, these color phases, are all locality specific. So yeah, just like the Miami saying. phase is obviously going to be found in and around Miami and in the Keys of Florida, and then um, the uh, Okatee obviously found around there, and then the nominate phase is everywhere else basically. And uh, what is quite interesting. Uh, with these locality influences is what people start doing is then is they start crossing the morphs into these localities to make up special looking corn snakes so like a, a normal example would be if you take a miami phase corn snake i believe and you put the albino or amal gene in there then it is what they call a candy cane corn snake so that is quite interesting now I know where that candy, where that candy <laughs> cane came from. Because I went to go search candy cane on, what you call it, on Morph Market back in the day when I basically had, I purchased the candy cane from Ultimate Exotics. And they didn't show me anything, but then I thought, then how is this a gene? Same with this other type of thing, I've seen a Barbie corn snake. So... The, the Barbie corn snake, to my knowledge, is a simple recessive gene. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We could search it up as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think with the Barbie corn snake, there's a lot of line breeding going on to try to um, get animals as pink as possible. But to my knowledge, it is not locality influenced. I could be wrong. Yeah, because... Um, I remember, I think it was back in 2018 at the Brian Barks like, exp um, Expo. I purchased this corn snake, Barbie corn snake, and this snake was literally like a light pink with white with white species all around it. I asked this bloke, listen, can I get your number? He's like, no worries. Took the card number, I came back home, I, call, I called the bloke, I was like, listen, tell me a bit more about this Barbie corn snake. He told me no, it's just basically line breeding. It's not. It was a bunch of amal in the sticks. Well, more snows. I, because I know if you take an anery and you add an amal with it, the double head genes will turn into a snow. They said it was a line breeding of a snow corn snake, where they took the one with the most pink colors and they just added it again and again and again and again. Apparently, it was I think a 15, 18 year project. Just to get that pink corn snake. And they sold that snake for 250 rand. Wow. That, that is insane. Wow. For that long I didn't years. know that. That is probably then accurate then to assume that it is a just a line bred snow. So, wow. That is interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, it is. So, but yeah, just, just some of those stuff. Because I know a lot of people tell me uh, it's a morph or it's a locality. And then... Some people don't even know of the word line breeding. But yeah, like, like I'm saying, a lot of people, well, as what I've told them, like you get localities, you get morphs, and then you, you just get a variety of different colors produced by line breeding. So a lot of people don't really know the differences between those three. So can you um, explain a bit more about what's the differences between a morph, a locality, and line breeding? Sure. So a morph is basically a, um, a mutation. So something happens with the young as they're formed inside the mother snake. Something radical happens. It could be just random or it could be because due to inbreeding, which often is the case of it, radiation exposure, I have read, and uh, a few factors like that can influence it, uh, creating this new mutation, which causes the animals to show the, um, the, the genotype and the phenotype of looking a certain way. So a common example of that would be an albino animal where the what the gene does is it completely removes any melanin um which is the uh dark um the pigments what's the pigments yes the thank you um in their skin so then it works like that a, a locality is basically just the difference between uh, different places geographically 
um, how an animal would appear to look. So, for instance, like with the corn snakes, like we see the Miami phase corn snake is obviously going to be found in and around Miami, Florida. Whereas the nominate phase of it, with the more normal looking ones, they're going to be found elsewhere. So that would just be their differences geographically. And that, I would believe, has to do with the terrain and the foliage and you know just the biome in general looks different so to aid in camouflage they obviously have to look a little bit different and then line breeding finally is line breeding can come in two different forms the first one would be the refinement of a morph so let's say for instance you had you hatched out a clutch of albino corn snakes and you see that one of these hatchlings or maybe multiple of them hatched out looking a little bit more white or whatever and you decide okay you you have this desirable trait and you want to pass it on and enhance it so then you would breed basically the whitest of those albinos to each other and then a few generations down the line you would end up with something which looks a lot different than the normal albino that you started out with and then the second form of line breeding involves that of uh, basically exactly the same thing except it is not to do with a mutation animal so i know like the for instance the locality the ocean county um northern pine snakes they're known for having a bit more of a high white and black color. So then they line breed those. Just it's no more if it's nothing. It's just a locality which they then take further and enhance it to get animals with more uh, high black and high white into one package. So, yeah. All right. So talking about line breeding. Um, do you personally think people can also line breed for the size and the growth of the animal? For example, try to, um, how can I say, speed up the growth and also make it look like a bit more bigger than a lot of red ticks. Well, for like a lot of red ticks. And also, like they does with the, well, like I said, with the size. Some people want them smaller, some people want them bigger. If I can say so. Yeah, so to answer that question, I just need to clarify that by line breeding, that it refers to when you breed animals who are very closely related to one another. So like a sibling or a you know really close relative. I do think that it is necessary to try to pair up animals with the best possible personalities and all of that. Like for instance, Let's say you get a clutch of hognose snakes, maybe not hognose snakes, let's say a clutch of corn snakes, and two or three of these corn snake babies, they just don't want to eat properly. And, you know, you got issues with them, they don't want to eat. If you then go and you breed those snakes with other snakes, the next clutch, you could end up with an entire clutch of picky feeder corn snakes. It's just a silly example, but... In nature, not all of the babies survive. So I think sometimes we, we got to remember that and uh, try to definitely breed just for the strongest animals to one another. So for breeding corn snakes, um, since they're from a fairly, how can I put it, more tropical, I think it's a subtropical region that you're talking um, I'm not too sure what, what Florida is really Wait, called. Corn, corn, yeah, Florida is so a swampy on. area. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't really know exactly what it is called. I probably should have uh, researched that more thoroughly. But uh, their range does extend north into New Jersey, so like I mentioned, uh, meaning that they are fairly hardy and really not that hard to breed at all. For brumation, a cooling period seems like it does benefit them in a certain sense um, but then again corn snakes have been bred so long in captivity that 
a lot of breeders just won't uh, brewmate their corns anymore. They just, some people just see it as good practice to do that. So, um, but I definitely do, I am a strong believer in uh, species like this, which tend to, you know, be fine with no brumation, at least to give them some sort of food cycling or such, and at least a, a day and night um, a difference so that they can at least feel like there is some seasonal change going on to stimulate uh, follicle growth in females and a good sperm count in males so that fertility can be good. Um, with corn snakes, the average clutch size is 12 to 24 eggs. So that is a pretty sizable clutch for anyone getting into corn snakes. That is uh, definitely decent, I think. Um, most of these North American rat snakes seem to be in that, that uh, kind of area concerning eggs and stuff so that is pretty awesome and i know some people might say you know uh, you have to brumate them otherwise they the babies will come out all kinked and stuff and the reality of that is uh kink tails and all of that is usually due to two things that is inbreeding if excessive inbreeding goes on then usually that happens and the main reason for king tails, I would say, would come down to incubation. If you're incubating your eggs too hot, then they will hatch earlier, but then there's a greater risk for sure with king tails and stuff. If you um, can brumate, uh, um, incubate your eggs a little bit cooler, then they, you'll see that the babies hatch out a lot bigger, they can handle bigger prey items, they seem more healthy and I mean honestly waiting a week longer to, for them to hatch is no big deal so yeah, yeah that is the case but yeah um, you also think um, well a lot of this formalities etc can also um, determine of the female stress levels as well or I think it doesn't really have an effect on that it could there might be scientific evidence which could back that up but I think that if a female is stressed out, then um, fertility rates would just not be as good or you will probably um, get it where it happens where she'll just slug out, you know, not give any fertile eggs, it'll just be slugs. I think the, the kinks and stuff wouldn't have a direct um, influence with that. Uh, makes sense because remember when no, I got my I first corn snake um, well yeah my first clutch it was between 26 27 eggs um, did I ever tell, tell you a story about my first clutch of corns okay so basically what happened yeah I think it was between 26 27 eggs around there and before around a week or two before the eggs hatched so I had that female with two different males and I was super stoked for breeding the female and then I basically I took her added, added her to the one male which was a a melanistic minibus and then the second male was a massive a melanistic motley stripe and um, both locked and I basically made a couple turns with her with the males about I'll probably say around two or three hours later I let her settle Two weeks before she laid eggs, she escaped and she got at the back with my huskies. And luckily my huskies didn't do anything. They only barked at her and tried uh, running around there because I trained my huskies. If they see a, a snake they, or any type of lizard or frog, they just stay around two meters away, two or three meters away and just bark. So if, I, if they start barking, then I know there's a snake around. So they did that, she was standing straight up around 40, 50 centimeters in the air with her, with her mouth gaping open, sounded like a puff at her. Took her in, two weeks later she started to lay eggs around 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. So I took those eggs, added it into my incubator. So I know a lot of people use the fridge incubators. How I started, I used a polystyrene box container. I added a little window in 
and then inside I added two bricks, water and a fish heater. Then at the top I used mesh and then I had a small little tub where I had my eggs in. Inside I added vermiculite and perlite. Add the eggs in, close the tub, place inside the incubator, close it. I left it there for, apparently you should leave them for I think 50 some, 56 days or so. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no. yeah, usually for any snake, it seems like the 60 day period or so there around is the, the, the gold standard, usually. Really? Yeah, because my, yeah, it was on the 56th, 56th day. The one started uh, popping the head out. And unfortunately, so I was basically, well, eager because I wanted to see how they would look like. They all started attaching out, etc. And the couple that didn't attach out, I cut the eggs open. So when I checked over there, it was a couple normals and a couple emails. However, all of them had kinks. And like, probably like 30-40% of the clutch survived. The rest were just all passed. Fully developed, but all of them had kinks. So I think my temperatures was probably too high, as you stated over there. Because of the fact that first they hatched out too early, and second of the kinks. So I think I learned yeah. my lesson over there with those. Yeah, no, I think definitely that would be temperature related. Um, it And you say it was this female's first time breeding as well. No, nah, it was... Uh, she was an old female. She was around five, six years old. I got her from a breeder from, I think, in Western area. She probably had over a couple locks around, probably like two or three locks. Well, yeah, two or three successful breedings. And then I tried her out with my males as well. So, yeah, just to show she is actually fertile and she had a couple, well, yeah, eggs back in the past as well. Yeah, um, back to the, um, the, 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 let's get into feeding real quick. Um, so for corn snakes, the, their bulk of their diet is going to consist of corn snakes, ach, corn snakes, <laughs> uh, rodents, and occasionally small reptiles and amphibians are also taken. It must be the small reptiles that I must have thought of, but, uh, um, this goes for most of the species on this list, I think. And that's just because they're opportunistic feeders. But it seems like in captivity, they do just fine us providing them with a strict rodent diet as it seems rodents are fairly well balanced concerning their calcium, protein, and fat intake. Their, their nutrients um, balance is fairly good. So uh, that, that is really nice. Uh, rodents seem to be fairly readily available. Most places in the world, here in South Africa, we do struggle a little bit to get good quality captive bred um, rodents, but it seems like uh, that is, it's, it's not the hardest thing to find. All right, well, let's get into the next species real quick. Uh, the next species is the infamous Texas rat snake, Panthrophus obsoletus Lindheimeri, discovered by Lindheimer, the botanist from Germany, I believe, in Texas. From Germany in Texas? Was he on a... Yeah, it's a German botanist, to my knowledge, who first named and described the Texas rat snake in Texas. So, I and a, a few plants uh, were also named by him, so... That is, uh, that's how that goes. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, basically, well, back then I wasn't really a good fan about Texas rat snakes until I've seen that Ultimate Exotics, uh, well, basically started getting them up for breeding, etc. I think you purchased yours from, from Ultimate Exo Exotics, I think, at the expo? Uh, no, I, I purchased it from someone else, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, as I remember... Uh, you, you still have it though, the uh, leucistic of yours. Uh, I used to have a trio of leucistic Texas rat snakes, uh, so I could definitely comment more on the species for sure. Um, but no, I unfortunately, beginning of this year, I did downsize my collection considerably, and they were one of the snakes to go. So, oh, yeah. it's sad. 
But yeah, what's your personal experience with keeping those? Because I know a lot of people, after seeing those pictures, they'll be popping me up in the comments. Alex, where can I get this snake? Where can I get this thing? How, to, how can we take care of this animal? So, yeah, just give us a couple of your experiences with those. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, the Texas rat snake, as we can see here, is a, a subspecies of the black rat snake, which is the next one that we'll discuss. The Texas rat snake is, in my opinion, probably the second most readily available uh, North American rat snake or Panthrophus in South Africa. Um, Texas rat snakes are definitely a special kind of snake. You definitely got to be a special kind of person to keep Texas rat snakes. They have this pretty interesting demeanor about them. They do vary and you do get those that do calm down. But uh, of my trio, one of them was just, I wouldn't say un, I was unable to work with, but definitely didn't really ever tame down and like me as much. So, yeah. He was just always, always in a bad mood. That time of the month, but that time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. So they're definitely not for everyone. Um, I heard something interesting on a podcast the other day. A uh, guy said that people often send him pictures of Texas rat snakes and black rat snakes, and they ask him, you know, what snake is this? And it, wait, is this not a Texas rat snake or is this not a black rat snake? He says there is an easy way to tell the difference between a Texas rat and a black rat. He says, go touch it and you'll know what the difference is. The Texas rat will most likely try to light you up. So, <laughs> but yeah, so, so how, how, what's the worth it? How common do we find Texas rat snakes around here in South Africa? Um, so they're definitely going to be... Uh, not as readily available as corn snakes, for instance, um, but you definitely do um, find them. And what's interesting about Texas rat snakes, because they were, to my knowledge, one of the first leucistics um, found within a, any species of snake, really, and bred um, for the first time in captivity, the leucistic uh, Texas rat snake is, in fact, more commonly available than the normal Texas rat snakes. So that is quite interesting. Uh, Texas rat snakes are definitely out there. You can find them for sure. If you get in touch with some breeders, there's a, there's a, a handful of people who really do work with them and they, they're getting some good things going with them. Uh, so you, you could definitely find them, but uh, they're probably not going to be like the corn snake, which you can pick up in any old pet shop. You'll probably have to jump online and get in touch with someone, or you'd have to spot one at a expo or whatever. So, yeah. So for Texas rat snakes, this is uh, an interesting species. Because unlike um, some of these other rat snakes, most of these other rat snakes are going to be primarily diurnal. But it seems to me as though Texas rat snakes have a preference to be more uh, crepuscular. So more active from uh, dusk, uh, uh, you know, twilight hours. So um, for a display species, Texas rat snakes just don't really fit the bill as a uh, pantherophis goes. They, and I, I wonder why it is like that, because if you think about them in the wild, you do find them above ground and out in the open, even though it seems like they frequent gopher burrows and hiding away most of the time. Uh, but then again, you think pityophis, the, um, gopher, bull, and pine snakes, they seem to do fine above ground as well um, and aren't too too scared of people and whatnot. So I have actually thought of a theory, um, and that is that because leucistic Texas rat snakes in particular 
have been bred so many years in captivity, what are people breeding them in? They're breeding them in rack systems. So that then gets etched into those snakes and that is basically what their preference becomes. It becomes part of their um, husbandry, basically, what, they, what they, they think is normal to them. So if you're keeping Texas rat snakes, um, I would definitely recommend getting a rack system or at least something which is dark for the most part because these snakes don't really seem to do as well um, in an enclosure kind of a visually stimulating environment. It is so because, well of course as you just said, unlike the gophers and the pond snakes being more out, because if you look at those animals in the wild, you know how big gophers can get and you know how big pine snakes are. So it's like our mole snakes. You see mole snakes, like especially the big ones, just roaming around in the fields. You don't really see them hiding much. So I think that's also the, for the fact that they're a big snake, like especially with the pythons. You don't see pythons trying to hide away in, of course I say our Africa rock pythons a lot in big jackals, burrows, etc. But like the retics and the berms, they're more out in the fields, etc. So in a way it's more understandable why the rat snake, especially one of those who just want to hide, especially the smaller snakes. So, but yeah, speaking of rat burrows and yeah, the, the food sources, how would you describe their feeding? Um, so for Texas rat snakes, um, the, this is quite interesting actually. Um, the other common name for a Texas rat snake is also called the chicken snake. And that is because these snakes are found so much by uh, people in their chicken coops in wherever they're from. You know, their, their range, if we could quickly jump on that, is primarily Texas, but its range does extend into Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So... Um, these snakes are, for the most part, really not that picky with food. Um, you will run into the occasional hatchling, which does um, not really uh, want to eat or anything. But there are definitely methods you can use. Um, I've heard that um, the uh, braining, if you brain pinkies, that can entice them to eat. Um, I've heard that chicks, they go crazy for chicks. Um, if you if you want to add a bit of a, a varied diet to them, but for the most part, rodents are going to be the bulk of their diet as well, and you're not really going to have any problems with feeding them. So, yeah, they're they're really bulletproof. These snakes. Yeah, it's also understandable. But yeah, talking about as you just said, braining, because I know not a lot of people know what's the meaning of it. Can you uh, tell the viewers a bit more what, what's the meaning of braining a pinky? Uh, it is basically what it sounds like. It is where you take a pinky and you basically put a little incision in or pop its head open and expose the brain so that that I don't know why it works, but it seems to trigger something in the snakes, which makes them think, oh, well, this is interesting and this is food. Also, another thing I will say with the Texas rats is a lot of times they um the ones that uh, definitely more hatchlings ones that haven't been as um um how should i put it cooperative and wanting to eat a trick which i use usually as my first line of trying to get them to eat would be tease feeding them where you basically take the prey item on a tongue a frozen thought of course you don't want to cause any um, issues with live unless you're feeding um, uh, uh, picky picky eaters the live um, pinky mice or something like that something which can do too much damage um, you basically poke the snake with this prey item with your tongues and that basically entices them to either get into a strike pose and then they strike at the food and like nine out of ten times when they strike and they latch onto the food, then they realize, oh, but this is food. And then usually they'll go to swallowing it from there. So you can try poking them on their tails where they're quite sensitive and also uh, tapping them lightly 
on the head also works sometimes. So it is yeah. so. Because I know when I basically started with the breeding of corn snakes, well, not long after my second clutch, I ran into a bit of a problem because my corn snakes didn't want to eat. So I tried a couple different, well, t types of feedings. Well, first it was the assist feeding. Because I don't know why, but me with um, tease feeding it didn't really go so well because my animals didn't really well try even biting it so they didn't even tr try going to a strike mode or anything at all and then if that didn't work then I tried this thing called liquidizing food so basically what we did I learned this trick from one of the breeders that well the black's name was Jonathan he was one of the corn snake breeders here in Cartonville. And he basically did the same to his corn snakes as well, where he would take a pinky and, f for example, a pinky and, what's the other stuff called again? Chicken liver, yeah, no, not chicken liver, uh, beef liver, etc. Add those variety of meats and then just liquidize it. And then he adds them into little containers, he froze them, and then we once he used it, he just, uh, well, he thought it out place into a needle and then tube feeding the snakes and then after a long while I tried get, getting back to assist feeding and then once it was successful then I'd let it go other times if it didn't work at all for none of those and they buff out the for example the liquids then I tried force feeding now force feeding is when you take the pinky and you take it you just push it straight down way way into the belly and not like pushing way down just take half of the pinky like just place half of the pinky inside the mouth and then just try to massage it down into the belly that was probably my most common well method because my snakes didn't want to eat at all well especially with uh, most of my breedings with my corn snakes but yeah so how can I state it moving on to the breeding of the Texas rat snake, how would you describe those? Uh, cool, I'll describe that uh, for you now. I just uh, also uh, another thing which you mentioned with the um, uh, liquidization and stuff. I have also heard uh, more. I heard this more for um, Pityophis is that what works is if you boil pinkies. Uh, then that for some reason will entice picky feeders so that would definitely be something you could consider trying as well if your um, Texas rat or corn snake or any rat snake really would not want to eat then you could try that as well but uh, for breeding of Texas rat snakes I have never personally bred mine um, the trio that I had will probably be breeding by the person I sold them to sometime next year so I'll be excited to see the results of that uh, uh, pairing um, but for Texas rats being from Texas Louisiana Arkansas and Oklahoma some of those states they get fairly warm in summer and fairly cool in the winter so for Texas rat snakes I would definitely of all the snakes on this um, list i would definitely for them uh and then the black rats of course definitely more recommend you doing uh some kind of a cooling cycle on them so brumation would definitely benefit them more to stimulate uh, uh follicle growth in females and sp a good sperm count in males so i would definitely do that you could still probably breed them without cycling them your clutch sizes would probably be a little bit smaller, but at least, like I say, uh, try to get a um, a food cycling type thing and a day-night cycle so that they um, feel at least like there's some seasonal change and stuff. Um, but like, yeah, Texas rats have been in the hobby for so long, so uh, that, that might be uh, something which you could... Get right and by food cycling i mean um increasing the the food coming out of a colder season so as you're going into your winter period you feed them less and less and then for two to three weeks maybe a month you 
kind of stop feeding and then you start bumping them up with food again hitting them quite hard so that the female can handle that food um for and this goes for really most snakes in general um your females you want to have them uh really really big enough to handle the eggs and stuff so you need to feel that there is a decent amount of fat you don't want to breed an obese animal but at least feel like there is something on there so that the female can produce that maybe just before um, breeding bumper with a prey item which is higher in fat like rats I know that is a usually a good way I could see that when I fed my female rat she put on fat really quickly so um, then you could do that but your male snakes you do want to have them fairly slim because a big fat male snake is going to be too lazy and sperm counts not going to be good and he's not going to want to breed so try to keep your males lean and mean and your females uh, decently fat. Yeah, decently good size, etc. And also weight is also, the weight is also pretty important as well. So it's also a good thing to be able to have that. And also, yeah, also because of the growth. Because you don't want a female that's like 60 centimeters and weighs around 150 grams or so. That will just be, not only... It will cause problems with the eggs, but also to the female itself, especially with egg bound, etc. Where that's more female, it's like how can I state it? It's like a 12 year old girl that gets pregnant. Of course, there's going to be a lot of problems when giving birth to a child. So, I always have to have in mind your males, I think at, at eight months old, they can start breeding. Um, so, yeah, they. They, they definitely, it depends also on how much you feed them, but uh, Texas rat snakes can be sexually mature from a year or so old, so I'd, I'd go for more of the 12 month range, but I hear that you would preferably want your snakes to be around the two year mark before you start breeding them. Uh, for males, you'd want them to be uh, at least about two years old. For females, you're talking okay, more than three sense. to four years. Because I've heard a lot of people Especially with the colubrids, they take males as around a month. No, not holy shit, not a month, not a month, not a month. Eight months old. <laughs> yeah, males around eight to eight months old to a year, and then females more than two years old, preferably. Um, but yeah, so going on to oh, so we're done with this species. How about we go to the next one? Um, could we just quickly jump back? I just oh, sorry, to, um, my apologies. Um, could we just quickly jump back? I just want to um, quickly mention um, for the the size of the species. Um, so it seems like the average size for adults seems to be 1.2 to 1.5 meters as adults. So that is really a, a decent size animal already, much bigger than a corn snake. It's already something that is a bit more impressive, but not overly huge or anything. Um, and I will mention as well that um, for females, it is not uncommon for them to get 180 centimeters long, so 1.8 meters. And this is pretty insane. The unofficial uh, record length that I hear is um, 218 centimeters. What? Two meters for a Texas rat snake. That is freaking massive. Holy... Mm. I've, I've seen rat snakes in South Africa being not longer than a meter long. And now a year of rat snakes being two meters long. Te a Texas rat snake. First a year, I'm shocked to hear about the corn snake being 1.8 meters and now a year of the Texas rat snake being two meters long. What's next? Re retex being 10 meters long. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's crazy. The two species on, the that one is really going to shock you. The the Spiloides one is, is going to shock the heck out of you. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, let's carry on with uh, black rat snakes. Um, 
Panthrophus obsoletus, um, also uh, termed the western rat snake because they are found west of the Mississippi River. So, you know, they're fairly centrally based within the United States and they do have a wide range which uh, does extend up into southern Canada. So they can handle some pretty insane heat and cold which makes them a fairly hardy species. Yeah, so it's pretty bad. Uh, what is your take on black rats? When was the first time you heard about them? And, so uh, I've yeah, heard about, you think about black rat snakes before. However, this is the first time I've ever had a well a conversation about them. Like I've heard of the name. I was like, for example, reading a book is like, oh cool, it's a okay cool black rat snake. That's cool. And now we're actually having a conversation about them. This is literally the first time I've ever had a conversation about them. So I don't really have that much, if I can say to say, not that much info on them. But I know you're the expert on it, so you'll probably know a lot more than me, if I can say to say. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Let, let me teach you a little bit more about them. So, uh, Panthrophus obsoletus is the thing to remember which is quite interesting because the texas rat snake scientific name is panthrophus obsoletus lindheimeri so the texas rat snake is basically a subspecies of black rat snake and well recently taxonomists and crazy people have decided to lump these two together to form what they now call the western rat snake so even though they do look remotely different and they act completely different, um, the Texas rat snake used to be called a subspecies of the black rat snake. So they're very closely related, actually. Um, black rat snakes are called that because uh, the general most common form which in these snakes come is basically as an adult a jet black snake with a sort of um, like a white um, uh, or cream colored uh, belly and um, sort of their, their lower uh, labile um, scales are also fairly white. But um, locality difference is there and some localities do exist with some patterning but primarily they are black but uh, some with uh, pattern and saddles do exist. Um, whereas with the Texas rats, for instance, even the adults, they seem to most of the time have some sort of pattern and saddle count to them, um, uh, wh which I forgot to mention. The Texas rats seem to come in usually a brown kind of color. Some of them are more like a rusty orange or red color. And then you get those that are definitely more black and tend to look uh, more like a, a black rat snake. So, yeah, it's, it's okay, quite that's, interesting. Yeah, that's a lot of info to take in. So, well, especially with the black rat snake now, um, do, you, do you think we actually find those here in, in, in South African captivity? Sure, yeah. Um, black rat snakes are definitely a little bit more... Uh, uncommon than Texas rats as far as I have seen what is available um, they definitely are around and you can find black rat snakes um, hatchlings are a little bit hard to find it seems like usually the ones you're gonna find are gonna be adults or um, yearling animals uh, so I'd say Texas rats are definitely gonna be more uh, commonly available but um, black rats we definitely do have in South Africa um, and uh, morph wise is actually quite awesome the morphs that we have in South Africa uh, the two morphs that I have seen available for sale is um, or well I've I've seen three of them available uh, one of them I haven't seen visually but I have seen as a hit animal so I'm not sure if we actually do have them or if some guy just wants to make an extra buck or, <laughs> or whatever so uh, the three morphs that we seem to have available in South Africa is the albino, um, which uh, would probably be a T negative albino. And then we have a hypo, which is the one that I'm not sure if we do have. 
Uh, we probably do because it seems to be a fairly common gene uh, throughout most of the um, ra black rats. And then we also have what they're calling a white-sided black rat snake, which is a pretty gorgeous snake in my opinion. It is basically what it says it is. Its sides are completely white, like a white wall tire kind of, if I can explain it that way. And then the top of their body, it breaks up their pattern also. So they don't have those saddles anymore, really, um, if, if they were a saddled animal. Um, but then they, they, they just have like a black kind of um, speckling uh, over the top uh, of their body so it's uh that yeah that that seems to be kind of what we have so far all right so it's at the moment just a couple focus status so localities and then the three morphs if you can stay so okay that's interesting yeah. so the price should don't trend them how would you state it well pretty expensive not that expensive so um yeah, um, for black rat snakes, honestly, not really a very expensive animal. Um, for, and I can't remember from the top of my head exactly what they go for, but I think I saw uh, an adult available the other day, just a normal uh, black rat snake adult, uh, normal available for, I think it was uh, 2,000 rands for just a normal uh, adult um, so I'm guessing that hatchlings would probably be around the 800 rand mark or there and I yeah, I reckon so between 8 and uh, yeah 800 and K 10 to 1 yeah and uh, al albinos I haven't uh, albinos seem to be going for around the same as uh, the normals as far as I know just because of the fact that they uh, the albino doesn't really in my opinion do a black rat so much justice it's kind of a, a, a weird looking albino because it's just, it's a weird color we'll throw pictures of one up here so that we can see uh, what that looks like, but it's it's not a, a pretty animal in my opinion. So they seem they seem to be going for around that as well. I've seen hatchlings go for sale ultimate exotics at around a thousand rands, uh, I, I believe, for a single baby albino black rat snake. Oh, okay. For a snake, off, I, I haven't seen it all year in captivity in South Africa. That's a good price for a rat snake, though. Especially for one of those, though. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And the, oh, and then the white-sided, I forgot to mention. Um, white-sided um, hatchlings seem to be going for around 1,500 to 1,800 for a hatchling. So I think an, uh, uh, an adult animal would definitely be worth a lot more, probably around the three to three and a half thousand rand range so even that for what you're getting the white sided is really something i would get into and uh what i've seen people do overseas as well because they're all um recessive uh traits i would totally if i had the time and money and resources get into black rats to uh do the project of a, a double recessive an albino white sided black rat snake I think would be just so cool looking and I think it would be a good project to pursue. Oh, alright, yeah, why not. You know, the focus there is, uh, all right, I'm actually quite curious about how, the, how these morphs are looking like because I've never even heard of albino and hypo rat or black rat snakes. But yeah, we're, we're going to add a picture about that. Well, I think we already did. So, <laughs> But yeah, speaking of, um, so the hatchlings, the adults, etc. How would you describe their breeding? So it's the same as the other rat snakes. So yeah, for um, black rat snakes, I think they're definitely um, because they're more closely related to the Texas rat snakes. I would definitely also go for a um, a cooling period, giving them that. So brumation, I'd say, would definitely be something you should consider. If you want to keep black rat snakes, um, they 
being that their range does extend into southern Canada, I mean, that is a pretty insane cold. But being such a, a, a snake that comes from such a, a wide range, that does translate to hardiness in captivity. So you could probably breed them like with the Texas rats without um, brumation, but food cycling, once again, I would recommend. Um, but yeah, from my understanding, a brumation is definitely the, the way to go. It would be good practice as well. Um, for breeding but yeah other, other than that I think that they are a fairly easy species to breed and um, for someone who wants to get into some bigger rat snakes I would definitely recommend black rats over Texas rat snakes even though I have kept uh, um, Texas rats before and I really enjoy them they're they're my love and passion or used to be <laughs> uh, the black rat snakes their demeanor seems to be generally just so 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 nice they are very rarely defensive and they make just absolutely great captives overall so i would definitely get into them and uh overseas especially in the united states there is not just three morphs available um, I have a list here of, of some uh, a lot more morphs that they have available like brindles um, they have a, a leucistic version of that so it's basically like a Texas rat snake but it's a black rat snake and it's leucistic so uh, they have licorice black rat snakes they um, have lavenders and then they they mix all of those and there's they're they're just pretty pretty awesome so uh, yeah they're definitely something I would look into and highly right. recommend. But yeah, uh, just looking at all project. those type of morphs and the, for the fact that I didn't even know, well, me working with all these animals for such a long while, I didn't even know of the black rat snake having that much morphs. Also, speaking about morphs, I think about two weeks back, I've heard of a uh, Danakish Shonakuris, 100 pace pit viper, a piebald version. Oh, yeah. Now. Yeah, well, basically, I'll add that up into another topic when we're talking about venomous stuff, but just imagine those stuff. Just the, the fact that we learn such, that, such, such interesting stuff every single day, it just it fascinates me, especially being on this podcast where we talk about stuff that the other one doesn't, didn't even know of. It just, it sparks me up, it just be, makes me more interested into wanting to learn about these type of, sp of, of animals, especially with a colubrid such as yourself now. But yeah, it's quite interesting though. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no for sure. I do agree. And uh, I think a piebald um, Chinese sharp nose viper would be absolutely gorgeous considering how they look normally already. So, so beautiful. Yeah, it is. So I think after the podcast, I'll, see, I'll send you a picture. But yeah, getting back to the yeah, topic I, because I'd we're that. Let's, uh, going off about it. <laughs> yes, sure. Let's, uh, let's look at their size quickly. Uh, it seems as though they, uh, even though closely related to Texas rats, they do seem to be a little bit on the on the larger end of the spectrum, with their average also being around 1.2 to 1.5 meters. But it seems like the females frequent 1.8 meters more frequently than what uh, Texas rats do. So there is a possibility you could end up with a six foot black rat snake. And listen to this. The official, this is not unofficial, the Texas rat was an unofficial, the official record length of a black rat snake is 256 centimeters, making them the longest rat snake in North America. <laughs> that is the size of my English teacher that can barely walk through a door. <laughs> mm, bloody hell, that's a long snack. <laughs> It's like the size of a full-grown yellow anaconda. <laughs> mm. Bloody hell. Yeah, they're, they're so big, in fact, that um, people suspect that they might be possibly the longest uh, snake in um, the United States, rivaling the indigo snake, which the indigos might be longer um, 
to my knowledge they are supposed to be longer i i definitely think they are but there is a possibility that there could be a black rat snake crawling around somewhere that is just absolutely massive but yeah no definitely one of the giants as far as the pantherophis are concerned and uh, also back to breeding uh, their average clutch size is 12 to 20 eggs as well so um, seems to be the, the golden standard for most of these colubrids and rodents also form the bulk of these snakes diet so it really is not that hard to keep these snakes alive so yeah they're they're definitely and probably on this podcast the snake that i recommend the most everyone look at um researching and keeping because they are just wow they're <laughs> they're amazing yeah they're such stunning snakes in my opinion but now that you talked about the variety of food sources, Secha, can you talk a bit more about the, what they eat in the wild? Yeah, so um, from my research that I have done um, and looking at, um, you know, where they are from in the wild, having such a wide range and being such a, uh, uh, or having such a, a, a wide range and different kinds of habitats means that they are like all of the snakes on this opportunistic feeders. So they they would predate upon uh, amphibians and smaller reptiles given the chance in the wild, but it seems like the bulk of their diet does um, include uh, rodents. So I would imagine uh, gophers, uh, voles, and um, uh, you know, shrews maybe even, I don't know if they have shrews in the United States, but uh, I'd imagine that would be probably, and then birds, I guess, as well, because these snakes, uh, which I forgot to mention, uh, Texas rat snakes and black rat snakes, they do enjoy climbing as well. And the black rat snake, unlike the Texas rat snake, black rat snakes make amazing display animals. And they, they do not shy away like a Texas rat will. They, for the most part, seem to really do well in a display enclosure and uh, they 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 just don't mind you being there so uh, if you if you're getting one in a display enclosure i would recommend uh, putting lots of climbing opportunities in there for them they really seem to enjoy that so yeah i i would imagine that birds would form a pretty big part of their diet as well being as they're such avid climbers and also for the fact that they are quite big animals for like a 2.5 meter long snake and you think they eat other stuff as well like rabbits and like grow runners etc as well yeah no for sure i think i think snakes usually <laughs> these snakes especially i think they would probably eat basically anything they can get their their mouths on so they they definitely don't seem to be picky or anything about food. It is so. Uh, now imagine the black rat snake. If that snake was in Florida, with those alligators, for a 2.5 feet long snake. <laughs> All those little juveniles. <laughs> yeah, that would be insane. Okay, so now we've done, well, we're done with the uh, corn snakes, we're done with the uh, what's it called again, Texas rat snakes, and also we're done with the black rat snakes. So what other, rat, what other clip are you All right, cool. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, next on my list here of, uh, and, and these are all rat snakes, which I I think would be uh, readily-ish available in South Africa. Um, there, there probably is some more, like the Everglades rat would probably be available. That would be the Panthrophus um uh, obsolete uh, Rosalina, but I don't. I haven't seen any of them available, and I don't know of any of them available. So there is a chance that they could be, and someone's just keeping hush hush. But uh, I just don't know. But these these ones are ones that uh, I do know that we do have available. So uh, next on the list would be the spiloids, so gray rat snakes. Um, these uh, snakes are a, a smaller species of pantherophis their average is uh, um generally their average size is quite small their average is around 90 centimeters 
uh, up until uh, about a 1.4 meters. So they're a bit smaller, but uh, now <laughs> prepare yourself because this is where I and I knew gray rat snakes as being a smaller species. They are generally a smaller pantherophis. They tend to lay less eggs. They're just a little bit smaller than the rest of the bunch. They don't get as big. But the maximum official recorded length, and this is official, like I said, was, I believe it was in a zoo, is a gray rat snake measuring 247 centimeters. So from my chest to my head up. That is terrifying. <laughs> I can't believe it. Like, I think it's probably evolution or something that basically makes these snakes evolve because we went all the way from being atoms to gigantic dinosaurs to be small little snakes and then growing back to big, what? python size rat snakes now <laughs> i think um also that this would and this is definitely an exception this this won't be any normal um snake out there is that there's probably two possible causes for this the first being that this snake wasn't just fed a regular small mouse once every other week or whatever this snake has been hit with a food like hard probably possibly a little bit obese i don't know and then secondly it does happen with humans that uh we get people who are born with a genetic disorder which makes that they never stop growing so i don't know if that is something in reptiles but judging by the insane size difference between this adult and what they normally reach my guess is that something like that probably happened where it had some genetic disorder that didn't make the snake stop growing and it just kept on eating and eating or it's just one of those freaks of nature so um yeah <laughs> we wouldn't really know the, so, that is yeah. true though but i think it's probably with the genetic because as far well i know of a type of fish it's called beta fish i basically breed them etc there is a morph for a beta called a giant beta it is a gen it is a genetic well it's more i think it's a i think a dominant either a dominant or a recessive gene and then with the uh, basically the next generation of those intend to be a lot bigger as well like so i think it might be a genetic i'm not entirely sure are they a genetic or a as you as you said a type of disorder where these animals or it's probably just part of evolution where these animals basically evolved because of the fact that they're probably in areas that are that have no predators and also when they don't have any predators then they just like you just said they just stop growing so i reckon that's also it might also well it's either a gene or a disorder or probably just evolution in my opinion but i don't know what, yeah, what do you I, suggest i honestly don't know things like this in the reptile world happen just for some reason or another but i think definitely food is also a determining factor as well i think because if you think about a kalatoa island um super dwarf reticulated python that snake if you feed it on a regular schedule it is going to max out at maybe two and a half meters um it probably won't get any bigger than that, right? Uh, so their their average would be around 1.8 to 2.4 ish meters. If you then go and you take a pure locality super dwarf, um, and you pump that thing with food ever since it's born, and as we know, retics love to eat. That thing, excuse me, that thing is going to grow like crazy. I have seen Kalatoa Island Super Dwarf Retics reaching upwards of three meters long. But then that animal is so insanely obese that it's just not really a healthy looking animal. There is this one guy on uh, the internet who has been posting things. Uh, people will probably know who I'm talking about. 
Um, but this guy, he has basically a collection of reticulated pythons and uh, a bunch of other animals. And almost all of his retics are just beyond obese. And uh, it's it at the end of the day, what happens is he's got these ginormous animals that are just way bigger than what mainlands usually do reach. Uh, but now then the problem comes that they are unhealthy because of their obesity. So, um, but even then, it does uh, only affect them um, up until a certain point. You're maybe going to get out of that Kalatoa Super Dwarf Retic another meter if you try hard enough. But it's such a small difference with this gray rat snake being like basically almost three times that size. I would definitely think that there might be some genetic influence as well. Maybe like a really exceptionally large male and a really exceptionally large female. I would be interested to see how the rest of that clutch would look like. But uh, yeah, I don't really know. I guess that's... No, that's also the case. That's just how it is. Well, honestly. And it also makes sense. And also, now that you mention about the food sources as well. Because, I mean, like, yeah, getting back to retics real quick. Um, so, the island localities um, of retics, they intend to, to stay small. And also, because of the fact that they all were so small basically worked it, it just got somewhere into their genetics to set, to stay that small reason why they're so small is because there ain't really big food sources on those islands and that's why mainland retics and tend to get large like they are because they ain't on these small little islands whereas the other top retics they just eat these small animals so they just intend to stay, to just stay small if i can stay so so where that rat snake probably was because of the fact that he was in a zoo and they gave it a variety of different food sources. Most of them unknown. Well, I don't know, do you do, you, do, you do any research on what they fed it or? No, no, not at all. Makes sense. No, no, not at all. So basically, let's just take an example. If they actually intended to feed that thing rabbits, and I mean like two or three rabbits a week, I reckon, but not like big ones, probably like juvenile, like hopper size. Then it, it might be understandable why that animal got that large. It's because it had a, not only one type of food source, but also various sizes of food sources as well. I think basically that resembles what most wild, well, animals in the wild as well. For example, if a snake is in an area with a variety of different food sources that are different sizes, I think that can basically have an effect on their growth as well. But also, in a way, not because I don't think snakes eat that regularly, unlike these ones that are in captivity. So I think that maybe might be the reason why they, that rat snake had that growth, if I can elaborate on so. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's get back on topic real quick <laughs> um, uh, with uh, our next thing to discuss on the gray rats so their captive population in south africa i have seen available they're probably just a l they're probably about the same kind of uh, uh readily available level as black rat snakes you could definitely find them you would probably have to uh, search on uh, the internet to find if you wanted or you would have to go to a reptile expo uh, and to my knowledge, there is no morphs available um, on the gray rats, at least in South Africa. I'm not even sure if there is um, uh, overseas. So, but they are a really, a really decent colubrid, and um, they seem to be fairly. Um, their demeanor seems to be fairly relaxed. You know, they they're not that bad. They're definitely more closely related. Um, demeanor wise to a black rat than a texas rat so they're they're pretty awesome little buggers their clutch sizes range from about 5 to 25 eggs so about the same as the most of uh, the rest of the snakes we've listed here and their um uh the bulk of their diet would probably be rodents as well and then um some extra 
uh, stragglers along the way, some amphibians perhaps, and birds and so on. Um, their range uh, is quite, uh, they have quite a wide range actually. I was really shocked at how wide their range is because I thought they were more limited to um, uh, j just like Texas, that kind of region. I didn't really know that they uh, have such a wide range. Um, their range extends from Florida all the way westward into Texas and then all the way up into southern Canada and some states, all of them in between. So that is a wide range right there. So the once again, like we say, uh, having such a wide range uh, would translate to hardiness in captivity. So these uh, snakes are pretty resilient to um, temperature fluctuations, humidity and all that. Um, but keeping them, I think, would be fairly easy seeing as they come from regions like that. And I, th I think breeding would also be quite easy um, seeing as where they're from. I think it would probably be good practice to give them a cooling cycle as well. Just do your research, obviously, to see exactly how you should do that. But um, yeah, and then food cycling, of course, also really important for um, uh, uh, stimulating that um, follicle growth in females and so on. But uh, yeah, these these are pretty interesting snakes. Um, what is your opinion on gray rat snakes? Uh, and uh, have you ever heard about them available in South Africa or not? To be honest, the only type of rat snakes I've heard of being available in South Africa. Well, of course, before this podcast, I've known of the red rat snakes, which are the corn snakes. I've heard of the yellow rat snakes. Well, that uh, when talking about North American species, it was the, the corn snake, yellow rat snake, and then the hybrid, which is the root beer corn snake, which is a hybrid between those two. And then, of course, of the... What's that thing called again? Oh, no, it's not a rat snake, my well, apologies. But yeah, just those three. But now hearing about the grey rat snake and also for the fact that it's actually supposed to be a small animal, uh, it's actually quite interesting. Personally, I think that if we can get these more common in South Africa, that'd be great. But I really want this species especially to not be as common as corn snakes because I want people to enjoy them but not over enjoy them, if I can state it as so. So that's my personal opinion about yeah, them. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, yeah, no, for sure. I, I agree with you 100% there. And uh, I'll get into um, caging a bit more in depth um, once we're done with our next uh, species of uh, discussion, which is going to be the yellow rat snakes or Panthropus alleghaniensis. Um, these snakes are from Florida, basically north into Maryland. So they also, like the corn snakes, seem to hug sort of the eastern coast of the country but their range does extend further north where corn snakes only really go into new jersey the yellow rats seem to go up all the way into maryland which by my understanding is the most northern point of their range um and yeah their their average length seems to be uh, 90 uh, centimeters to 180 centimeters which is a little bit bigger than most of the definitely bigger than the gray rat snakes and their um, recorded um, maximum length I think this is an unofficial record is uh, 228 centimeters which is also already pretty big for a snake um, so yeah and their clutch sizes is exactly the same as that of the um, gray rats so about 5 to 25 eggs and, um, you know, rodents being the bulk of their diet, they're pretty much a copy of the rest of the yeast. They're most, most of them are pretty much the same. Um, but yeah, yellow rats, they're, they're um, something interesting, which I just uh, thought about, which I'll get to after this um, on feeding is, uh, uh, I'll get to that later, but yeah. Um, the yellow rat snakes seem to have just one um, 
uh, color phase to my knowledge, which is basically a yellowish uh, undertone with black stripes running down their back. And that makes for a pretty interesting species. And uh, yeah, I would imagine that brumation wouldn't be too big of a thing for these guys, but food cycling definitely would be something to consider if you were breeding them. Other than that, I think that they're they're pretty straightforward. And I have heard mixed um, feelings about them concerning their temperament. I have heard people say they can be a little bit bitey and defensive, but for the most part, these snakes, if you work with them regularly and you have the right individual, they should calm right down and make pretty decent captives. Um, and yeah, they, the, they're probably around the same as the gray rat snakes, maybe a little bit less uh, available in South Africa, but you could definitely find them if you get in touch with some of the breeders who work with a wider range of uh, colubrids. But uh, yeah, what is your take on yellow rat snakes? Uh, have you heard about them or is this your first time? And uh, what do you think about them so far? Are they good or not good? <laughs> well, to be honest, back in the day, I actually had a yellow rat snake and it's quite a... Really? Just, yeah, I, I had a big one. It was a male. I got it in Fogful. <laughs> I think I paid not much, I think 1200 bucks for him and it was quite a big size and when I mean big I mean like 1.6 and a half meters long. So it was back in 2017, my cousin wanted to buy, what was it again, I think also a pair of corns and a ball python, I can't remember what gene. And this bloke basically was one of his mates from school. He bought a variety of different snakes in I think Centurion. And he asked me, listen, this bloke has a rat snake for sale. And I know you love your corn snakes. Would you like to buy it? I was like, yeah, no worries. We can probably go there. So we drove to Fogville. And this bloke had the enclosure on the bed with the snake in. He's like, um, okay, so just so you know, the snake is defensive. And I thought this bloke was probably teasing me just to test my, to see if I'll actually be able to take care of it by handling it. I was a bit nervous, but I took the animal out. Didn't bite me at all. The most friendliest snake I've probably, the most probably the most friendliest, well, rat snake I've ever handled in person. Because I've worked with Taiwanese rat snakes, not the friendliest of them all, in my opinion. <laughs> and there was other stuff called. I've worked with another bloke's rhino rat snakes. Well, you of course know the rhino rat snakes, and well, this bloke keeps them there in parades. But this rat snake. Quite same. So I basically kept it for about two or three months. And then after that I just got tired of Calubris and then I just sold everything. But my personal experience, that snake didn't get sick. It was eating the whole time. And what I mean like, probably I fed him a rat once a week. That snake, I don't know, probably my best experience with a rat snake I've ever, well, experienced with, ever handled in person, ever kept. So I don't know, my rhino, the rhino rat snakes, I, I just love them to bits. I, I wouldn't mind getting one again. The question is, how hard is it to find? And I wanted to know if it's actually a rare animal I had and if I should regret selling it. <laughs> yeah, that, that is interesting. I didn't know that you, you had a yellow rat snake. That is quite cool, actually. And um, yeah, well, like I said, they're probably going to be the same as the gray rat snakes. Um, available to a certain point but not the easiest thing to find you'd have to get in touch with a breeder or someone to get personally I have only seen yellow rat snakes for sale I think twice before so um, uh, definitely definitely something I would regret but uh, I, <laughs> I don't know about you um, but uh, yeah and then uh, that, that, that would you say about the Taiwanese rat snakes being bad um, it is generally assumed that they are the most relaxed of all the orthriophis out there so I have worked with uh, Ridley Eye before the cave dwelling rat snakes and I'm actually considering getting uh, back into keeping them and stuff and uh, even the Vietnamese Blue Beauties, they are just, uh, 
for lack of a better term, crazy. So, yeah, um, we should definitely uh, get a dedicated or three office podcast and maybe try to work with some more of those and then we can comment on how crazy they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the, and I think that would um, be like a little bit of a locality um, thing. It's either that or it is that you had an Everglades rat snake, which um, looking here at the pictures, and we'll throw some pictures up of the two so that you can see them side by side. Um, they, the Everglades rat snake seems to be a direct copy of the yellow rat snake, just a little bit more of an orange color. So I don't know if it's a yellow rat snake that was a little bit more orange, or if it was a cross hybrid animal, or if it was just purely uh, that you had an Everglades rat snake. And I don't know that we have them in the country, so uh, it could be that. But uh, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, because if we don't have those Florida rat snakes in the country, then it should definitely be a yellow rat snake. Or it's just probably like the line breeding, probably just made an orange color type of rat snake. So I, I think it might be also that. But yeah, that was also quite an interesting species. I didn't even know it was that rare to find like a, a rat snake for... Because I know rat snakes are rare. Especially North American rat snakes. Well, except the corn snakes, but that doesn't really count that much by... But for, like I said, the yellow rat snake, I didn't know it was a rare species until I asked you now. We're kind of shocked about that, unfortunately. But he... <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. And uh, now I will mention that what I had wanted to mention earlier. The yellow rat snake, and I I wonder if it is uh, the same with the Everglades rat snake. It probably is, being that they're so uh, closely related. Um, but I have heard that yellow rat snakes will eat eggs, and then they also have that crazy bone-like structure, the same as the Dacipelta species have, so where then it will crack the egg open and then it will regurgitate the shells of the egg out. So, and I don't know of it really that many other rat snake species out there that do that. So that is quite an interesting one for you on feeding. Yeah, I think that might be the case. But um, yeah, I know there's one black on TikTok. Uh, I'll, I'll follow him. I'll add his uh, link into the s description. So this bloke has a wild yellow rat snake living in his rat coop he doesn't remove it at all that snake chills there you can eat as many rats as you want he doesn't care the rat's name is kramer well the rat snake's name is kramer he always makes posts about this snake chilling on the roof or just hanging hanging out there underneath the closet and he'll make a video like hey kramer how are you doing kramer so then that basically just boosted up his views as well so I'll add a picture of the of Kramer the rat snake and I'll also add the TikTok link as well in the description. But yeah, anyways, you uh, do you want to carry on? Uh, yeah, so um, just to get back, uh, there's two two things that I mainly want to cover um, quickly on the and this goes for this is stuff that goes for every single one. Oh, and then there's just one other thing that I quickly remembered. Um, with the Texas rat snakes, um, there is, uh, to my knowledge, we do have albinos in the country, but I haven't seen available of them, just so we can talk a bit about morphs. And um, the uh, um, scaleless, we definitely do have scaleless Texas rat snakes in the country as well. So that is uh, an interesting one if you want a scaleless corn snake that is a little bit spicy, then maybe that is your kind of thing. So uh, we, we do have that, but there's very limited amounts of them and people breeding them. So then 
uh, yeah, I'd imagine it'd be a little bit harder to find those, but I think it would make for some really interesting projects in future, especially if we can uh, cross some of those, like uh, especially the scaleless into the leucistic and uh, the albinos, of course. And I didn't mention bubblegum rat snakes. It's a little bit of a controversial thing. To my knowledge, a bubblegum rat snake is a hybrid cross between a black rat snake and something else. What was it? Uh, it was something like a either a corn snake or a Texas rat snake. The albino, I believe, that is then what they term a bubblegum rat snake. But that is a hybrid snake. So, um, yeah, that, that is a, an interesting one. Uh, the two things... Yeah, the the two things that I wanted to uh, talk about was that all of these species, to my knowledge, they seem to undergo an ontogenetic color change from hatchlings into adulthood. That usually you can see that happening from around a year old, depending on how the animal grows. And the reason for this ontogenetic color change would be to... Uh, these animals have to adapt to their surroundings and they need to camouflage well in the wild. So one of the crazier ones, for instance, would be the black rat snake. Black rat snake hatchlings are, uh, these, uh, to my knowledge, pr fairly um, colorful with uh, decent amounts of um, uh, um, patterning and saddle count. And then uh, with each shed into adulthood, they seem to lose that. So that is something quite interesting. And then corn snakes as well. We know that a baby corn snake looks a lot much different compared For example, to the adults. So. I, how about the Miamis? And I don't think it's much of a difference. Now, I could tease. I don't really know. We can, we can throw some pictures up here and see what the differences are. But... Uh, yeah, the, all of these snakes, the they they seem to have a difference onto genetic color change, and then this is a, a quite a cool one, um, like a free tip Friday here <laughs> or whatever. Um, why I didn't mention uh, caging too much was because I was kind of saving it, and I was gonna lump these species together for this uh, caging part mainly. And that is that uh, one time I was uh, on Reptiles Magazine reading a care guide on a certain species. I can't remember what species exactly it was. I wish I do so I could go back there and check on it. But there is a general rule for caging. And that is uh, if you want to know what size enclosure your animal needs to be in, the general rule of thumb you can use is Take the length of the enclosure or tub that you're using and then add the width of that onto that. And that is the length of the snake you can put in there. So, for instance, let's say you are working with a yellow rat snake or whatever. Then the general rule of thumb, if your snake is, um, say, like, uh, what would be a decent length? say like a 1.3 meter long animal, then that would mean that your enclosure would have to have a minimum length of about 90 centimeters and have like a, um, a what was it, 30 or 40 centimeter width for the snake, if you catch my drift, to fit in there comfortably. Yeah, so for, for snakes that are larger than, than normal, then you would have to, um, uh, or, or then sometimes the rule doesn't apply anymore. So for something like a really insanely massive black rat snake, it doesn't always mean you have to get a five foot or six foot, or I mean a, a six foot or a seven foot cage because it's so massive. You could stick to something smaller like a five foot cage for anything over like, uh, a six foot animal so um and then also like i said this is just a general rule of thumb uh species do differ and there are smaller species that need more space so that they can uh, uh crawl around more and then the rule goes vice versa with i know with a lot of boa species 
because they don't move around a whole bunch, you could have them in a, a smaller enclosure compared to their their body size if you were to use this rule. So use it with um, caution. It's just a general rule of thumb that you can use. It is not a um, it's not set in stone. But if you are researching a species and you just consider some factors like is this a really active species? Um, is it arboreal, semi-arboreal, you know, fossorial or terrestrial species? Then you can use this general rule of thumb if you can't find the appropriate size enclosure recommendations online. So, yeah, there's a there's a cool one for you. All right, it also makes sense because some animals get stressed when they're in a large in, in a large area. Some animals get stressed when they're in a, in a small area. Some are comfortable in a large area. Some are comfortable in a small area. For example, ball pythons are reckon because they just I don't know the, I don't think they move around much. But stuff for example rat snakes like large rat snakes. I know for a fact they love moving around a lot. And then I don't, I don't see corn snakes being that active that much. Like I just see them lay lay there in the corner on their little heat mat. So so I don't really think they need that much space but preferably a big space but for small little yeah but for like hatchlings they don't really do well in a large space just stressing them out more and then for your bigger ones they can do that a lot better because they're more comfortable in the area so for small corn snakes and also other type of small rat snakes um correct me if i'm wrong with this but if they hatch, the best is just to place them in a little small in a small tub with their water dish and their hide box and to just hold them in there until they grow, grow the tub out. Then you can use that again to give them a bigger tub, a bigger tub way. Correct me if I'm wrong with this. No, no, I think you were you were fairly spot on. You wanna you wanna keep it as and but mainly um, with smaller snakes like that, especially where they do stress out quite easily, you would want to give them uh, plenty of uh, stuff to keep them safe, basically. So it would definitely depend on species as well. But if you were keeping in a rack system, for instance, then I would definitely think that um, you don't really need to put much in there, especially if it's a dark rack. Um, uh, not saying that we recommend this or that, but if you were doing it that way, you basically don't want the animal to stress out too much and stuff. So, and then something I would also say is, uh, you, it's better to go too small on an enclosure than too big. Obviously that means it's within boundaries. So you, you know, think logically about it. You don't want to be stuffing an animal that's way too big in a really, really cramped enclosure. But I see that adult animals can sometimes, if you chuck them in an enclosure that is way too big with not enough um, uh, uh, foliage and stuff to for them to hide in, they tend to feel very stressed out because they feel exposed. That will depend on species, obviously. But uh, th that's the two main things and it comes down to heating as well is most people keep their animals too warm too dry and in enclosures that are too small um, it is better to keep them in too small enclosures but yeah if you, sometimes you just have to use logic as well when you're thinking about um, setting up your enclosures properly yeah, it's speaking, well, it's actually speaking the truth. Well, it seems like we've been going on for two hours. If we missed anything, of course, we can add it to the next parts, etc. for the next podcast. But yeah, I think we basically covered up most of this stuff. But yeah, thanks a lot, Benji. Um, hopefully this podcast can help a lot of people who, are, who want to join in with the North American species, etc. Thanks so much for having me, man. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, you, first of all, starting up this podcast. We, like I said, we really need this kind of thing in South Africa. It's uh, really awesome to be able to uh, bring this kind of thing to just South Africa in general and helping people out with this. So 
yeah and uh, I think that's around it and um, I think yeah we'll see you all in the next one